from the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture. Today is Monday, May 23rd, 2011. We are in Argo, Illinois, a suburb of Chicago. My name is Joe Monier of the Southern Oral History Program at the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill. I'm with videographer and filmmaker John Bishop for the Smithsonian and Library of Congress um, Civil Rights Oral History Series. And today we're with Mr. Simeon Wright. Mr. Wright, thank you so much for graciously agreeing to sit down with us. We really appreciate it and we're glad to be with you. I'm happy that uh, I can accommodate you all today and be with you. Thank you. I know that Monday is a day that sometimes you're busy or relaxing with after a busy Sunday schedule. So thank you for accommodating our visit to Chicago on a Monday. Um, we have much to talk about today and I thought we might talk about I thought we might begin with something that's very close and very personal, I'm sure, in your memories, and that's just a description of your mother and your father. Well, my father, he was <clears throat> what we call kind of kind of hard man. Fair, you know, have you met someone that's tough but fair? That's the kind of man he was. He, <clears throat> he loved farming. He was honest. They found out, most of the people that he worked for in his early years, they found out that he was an honest man. If it didn't belong to him, he didn't bother it. And he was a hard worker and, and he enjoyed to see when, when cotton would begin to grow in Mississippi, he, he just became excited and I couldn't figure out why. But that's the kind of man he was. He enjoyed the, the farming and, and told my mother, he said, hey, I'm, I was born and bred in Mississippi. Mississippi, I'm going to die. Now, my mother, on the other hand, she was different. She was raised in Hazelhurst, Mississippi, below Jackson. And I think when my dad proposed to her, he, uh, she told him about picking cotton. He said, I don't know how to pick cotton. But I think they met in Memphis. Memphis was the headquarters for the Churches of God in Christ. And she heard my daddy deliver a message there. And believe it or not, her parents, lived in Sumner, Mississippi, where the trial of Emmett Till was taken. And she, while she was in Memphis, she was teaching school there. Back in those days, if you were African-American, you didn't need a college degree to teach school. But she was teaching there, and she moved back to Sumner to be near my dad, and that's where they got married in, in Sumner, Mississippi in 1925. She was an easy woman. She would sing a little like every day. She would be singing church songs and oh, she was something. And you know, with four boys at that time, she had four boys around the house. And we asked her one day, I'm sure we had done something wrong. We asked her, said, Mama, when are you gonna whip us? That's how easy she was. And, and we just, when mom would leave the house, we would be afraid something was going to come out of the woods, the bear or panther or something like that. But when she was around the house, we weren't afraid of anything because she was always moving, always busy, and that she would do anything to protect her children. She was somebody. Last year you published a beautiful book, a Simeon's Story, mm -hmm. um, yes. about the Emmett Till case and how it reverberated through your life in so many ways, even right up until the present day. Um, and I thought we might use, I thought we might start a conversation with just some reflections from you about how after this span of time, you came to choose to, to write that book. Well, one of the reasons I would, I would be watching the certain documentaries about Emmett Till and I would, I would see things that they would present that wasn't true and I would get very upset. And my wife, every time I would do that, she said, well, why don't you write your own book? And finally, after a couple of years of trying to persuade me to do it, I decided to, to write my own book and to tell what happened at the store, to tell the world what happened in my bedroom, to correct the, the myth and the inaccuracies that's out there. There's so many, so many out there. And, and, and one of them that really cut to the heart where they said that his cousin, that would be my brother Maurice and I, dared him to go into the store and say something to Calum Bryant. So I wrote the book to correct that, correct the, 
inaccuracies. Certain reporters, some one reporter said that my dad, he helped my dad escape Mississippi in a coffin. So I asked the question. I said, well, he had, he had three sons at the time. How did they get out of Mississippi? So that's my purpose of writing a book, to correct history and to get the facts out. Yeah. Let me take you all the way back. Um, I know you've had the opportunity to talk about this story on various occasions, um, and I appreciate your willingness to, to do it in this context also. Um, let me take you back to the summer of 1955. You're about 12 years old? 12 years old. And um, it's late in the summer? Late in the summer, uh, but uh, uh, when a kid is 12 years old, they're never 12. They're always 12 and 11 months. So I was a month away from my 13th birthday. You only give your correct age if you pass 50. <laughs> um, I think you have an October birthday, don't you? October 15th. That's right, that's right. Um, so the cotton harvest is about to come on? It was the beginning of the cotton harvest, late August. I, I Emmett arrived at my home uh, on a Saturday and we started picking cotton that Monday. You've written in the book about you, you felt a great deal of excitement anticipating the visit, not only by Emmett, but by some other members of, of your extended family. And, and can you talk about how you thought about that visit and what it meant to you as a 12 year old? Uh, once we found out that Emmett and Wheeler was coming to Mississippi, man, that, that, was, that was something. We just get so much joy to see someone from the North to come down to visit and tell us about, you know, life in Chicago in the North and always just full of excitement. We wanted to show them, you know, there's things that we did in Mississippi to have fun and whatnot. And we just couldn't wait till he got there. And when he arrived, we weren't disappointed in him because he's a great storyteller and he told us about Chicago. It, it was so great that some of the things he told me about Chicago, uh, Lincoln Park and that area, even today, we take our Sunday school picnic in Lincoln Park and North Avenue Beach every summer. And I heard it first from Emmett. And you had, 12 year old, you had been to Chicago? I had been there, but I had never been to uh, Lincoln Park. So you had made a trip up? I had, as yes. A I, child. I, yeah, I had, I, I think I put out in 1949, but I think it was the early 47. Mm -hmm. I stayed with my aunt and Alma right down the street here. Mm -hmm. Emmett lived in the basement, he and his mom and uh, her husband, Lamar Smallery. And I spent about two weeks here. That was one of the, the great memories of, of being here. But 2 p.m. in the evening, they Alma would gather Emmett and I together and tell me we needed a nap. So we was tired. I said, we're not tired. But that, that was the thing up north. You had to take a nap in the evening. Tell me about, um, tell me about Emmett Wheeler's arrival on your farm and how you, how you welcomed him and what you all set about doing the next few days. Well, we were talking about that, you know, after he told us about Chicago, told us about Riverview and Riverview Park. I couldn't believe Riverview Park. I mean, I just couldn't believe a park was this big, an uh, amusement park. And I heard it from him. And, and when I saw it the first time, I said, man, he just couldn't explain it, how beautiful it was. And of course, it shut down in 1967. Many of us cried because it was such a wonderful place to go to. And we talked and then my mother decided who's going to sleep with who. Emmett and I shared a bed. Uh, in my bedroom was two beds. Robert, my brother Robert's in one of the beds. And that, that, that Monday morning is, is, is time to go to the cotton field. And of course Emmett, he asked my dad could he go and my dad said yes. I'm thinking this guy got to be out of his mind because I had four years seniority in the cotton field from the age of eight until 12. And it was hot, and it was a hot job. But we told him, you know, we showed him the, the, the things we had to do in Mississippi. And one of the things we, we showed him how to you swim in Mississippi. You just don't jump in the water. The first thing you do is you run the snakes out of the water. Then you go and swim as long as you want. Make sure the snakes are out. And because back in those days, we were taught that snakes didn't bite in the water. And we believed that. But I found out later that that's not so. And we did what we do in Mississippi. We went down to one of our neighbor's house. He had probably half an acre of watermelons. And we, we taught him how to borrow some watermelons. And we each had one. And 
he thought that was a wonderful thing, you know. And then after that, <clears throat> that Wednesday, a lot of people think that on that Wednesday that we went to the store and that the men came to our house that same night. But that Wednesday, he wanted to go to Greenwood. We had picked cotton all day. We wasn't bored, as someone said that we, we was bored and, and we stole our daddy's car and we went into money. And I said, get out of here. The boy that told that he wasn't even there. And he claimed he helped Emmett steal my dad's car. And, uh, but the, in that account, in fact, I think I, I read that that false account that, yeah. um, that the, the, you even took the car while your dad was preaching and left church to go into town. Yeah. My dad's last sermon in Mississippi was in 1949. For some reason, he just stopped preaching. And the, the reason he came to Chicago that summer was he was invited to deliver the eulogy for one of his old parishioners. And that's how he actually got back to Mississippi, traveled back with my dad. And so we, we went to this, this little store and a lot of things happened. A lot of things in history that's just out there that's not true. Yeah. That, so it's, it's, the, it's the end of the day on Wednesday. And this would be the 25th now, I guess. 24th. 24th, excuse me. Let's take a little pause. Uh, we're rolling again. I was taking you back to um, to Wednesday, you're right, the 23rd, excuse me, of August. 24th. I beg your pardon, again, I made the same mistake. Wednesday, the 24th of August, um, 1955, and you were out that morning picking cotton. Picking cotton. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And can you take me kind of through the day from there on, and then how that how that fateful day kind of took its course? Well, in the morning we all get up, we have a pretty good breakfast, no cereals. You went last hour in that hot sun with cereal, and, and Emmett, you know, he 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 went to the cotton fields that Monday, and he came home. He he told my mom, he said, "Hey, Lizzie, I can't stand the heat." So he, he was at home all day. We picked cotton all day. I mean, what I mean all day, all day from sun to not quite dust. You had to have enough sunlight to weigh the cotton. And we, we finished up and arrived at home. We had supper. And then at that time, they, we decided to go to money. My brother Maurice was driving 16 at the time. Emmett and I, <clears throat> Wheeler, a uh, young man by the name of Roosevelt Crawford, I, one of our neighbors. And we went up to money and Maurice parked the car. I mean, we was in money in less than 20 minutes. I mean, people, what you heard in history, it seemed like we were there two hours lollygagging around, but uh, we walked over to Brian's store and Wheeler went inside of the store first. And, and then Emmett went in after Wheeler. Wheeler came out and Maurice sent me in behind Emmett to make sure that he didn't say anything that he shouldn't because he just didn't know the ways of the South. And, and the reason he did that, that, that Sunday we had gone to money and we, we bought some fireworks, which was common to us, but was new to him. And he began to set them off inside of the city limit. And that was a no-no. So that was the reason Maury sent me in there. And while inside of the store, he, Emmett didn't say anything out of line. Uh, there was no bubblegum stuff, you know, that we hear in history. He paid for his items, and we walked outside of the store. We were standing on the, that would be the south side of the door there. Uh, Carolyn came out, walking north towards her car, and before she can get off the little wooden walkway there, Emmett whistled at her. I mean, I usually I try to demonstrate the whistle. It was, yeah. it scared us half to death. And we couldn't get out of town fast enough. We, we ran to the car and, and Emmett saw our reaction and scared him. And we got in the car as fast as we could and, and got out of town. So less than 20 minutes, yeah. probably 10 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. And let, me, let me ask a couple more points about that. Because so many, so many different stories are told about, about um, those, those few minutes. Um, and your group was six. And so your brother Maurice, Mm -hmm. Yourself, right? Emmett Till, uh, Roosevelt uh, Crawford, mm -hmm. and Wheeler. Uh, Wheeler Park Jr. Right. And there was another young man. I, I want to say it was uh, James Pernell, but I, I'm not 
too sure, <laughs> but I'm neighbor. sure one because the other two gentlemen that's supposed to go with us, they, they got left. Yeah. 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 Um, did, did, um, can, you, can you paint a little bit of a, descript a descriptive picture of what you see in 1955 when you pull open the doors to the Bryant store, what it looks like in there? Well, we pull up, you know, uh, outside there's a, a bench there where people, some young men was playing checker. There wasn't no white man and black man. Trust me, there was no such thing. And inside of the store, you really couldn't see inside too good. You have to get inside because it got all this stuff in the, in the front window and whatnot. And the store, the floors were wooden, of course. There was a counter. You just couldn't come in there and get in contact with uh, the person behind the counter. As Carolyn said, that Emmett came in, and put his arms around and asked her for a date. That's, that never happened. But she, she made that up during the trial, wasn't under oath, because she knew that if she perjured herself that they could come back and get her. Well, the law, her lawyer knew, I don't know if she knew that or not, but her lawyer, they're some smart white boy, they ain't that dumb. And she said that, that's so I, t I tell people, say in order for that to happen, he have to jump over the counter. And the other stores mostly was closed that time of night. I don't know why, I, what, okay, this is it. I've learned later that on Wednesdays, all of the store closed early. That, that for some reason, I, I found out from my older brother, on Wednesday, we could go to the doctor there on Wednesday. So this is why our Bryant store was the only one open. He wouldn't, he wouldn't adhere to the rules of, of Money, Mississippi. Because actually, one day, when we first heard about him, he made one of the store owners close their store because he had told him, you know, we're going to close on Wednesday, and he didn't. And he pulled his gun, I made him close. So this is why we was at Bryant's store. Ordinarily, we went shopping his store. When you stepped inside, when, when your brother Maurice said, go in and check on Emmett, when you stepped inside, the, the moment was not particularly charged with any atmosphere or any confusion or upset emotions inside the store? You just found Emmett about to complete his purchase? And no, he's just look, looking for the stuff he wanted to buy and he purchased and we left. And, but uh, less than a minute. Now if he said anything before I got in there in that, that minute's time, I, I don't have no idea. Only Cal and Bryant can, can correct that. You were with him when he completed his purchase? R yes, yeah. yes, and we left the store together. And that seemed completely routine? Right. And she came out behind us, she was walking towards the car to get something, I don't know what she's going to get, and, yeah. and he you, whistled at her. You under, your, your understanding is that she came out to the car just to go out and retrieve something for a... She was going to retrieve car. something, right, but uh, I had no idea what she was going to get. Yeah. And he whistled and scared us, it scared us so bad. Yeah. And so you jumped in the car? We, got, we jumped in the car and, and man, we got out of town. So, so someone said, why did you run? Is it just like breaking a window? If you break someone's window back then, you, you get out of town. We had no idea that he would be killed for whistling at Calvin Bryant. That didn't even cross our mind. The only thing crossed our mind if we got caught, then we would be receiving a whipping from him. That's the only thing. And, and Maurice, my brother, we <clears throat> driving down this uh, dark field road. This road about seven, seven miles long, east to west. There's no, where we lived, there was no north and south highway. You couldn't travel north and south on a gravel road. You either had, they had dirt roads, but it went so far back to the wood line, that was it. And we, we drove about two miles. We lived exactly from the railroad tracks to our house was exactly three miles, according to my odometer. And about two miles down the road, Maury saw this, this lights in the rear view mirror so he thought it was Carolyn's husband chasing us so he stopped the car and they all jumped out of the car except me ran down through the cotton fields and trying to hide you know I figured I could hide in the back seat but it was our neighbors going home but when they got back to the car this is when Emmett begged us not to tell daddy what happened he didn't want to go home and we didn't want him to go home we were having so much fun and never dreamed that he would be killed for this. In that moment of the whistle and just after, did you move so quickly 
that you, did you have any occasion to see if there was any reaction from Mrs. Bryant at that moment? Or? A, a long look, uh, right. She, she, she did look, and, but when you're scared, you don't pay too much. <laughs> And, you know, it's in history that we were standing out lollygagging, so to speak, and that he had pictures of his white girlfriend. That never happened. There was no such thing. There was no white pictures. There was no picture of anything. Then they said that we dared him to go inside the store. I said, I said no. I said, my nephew that said that he wasn't even there. But they got him on film, eyes on the prize, saying that. None of that happened. Yeah, it's good. To, it's good to to take some care as you're doing to to bring forth your personal direct experience with this, mm -hmm. because as you're saying, there are, there are many stories that got attached to that moment that have nothing to do with what actually happened. Right. So, and one of them was all of the, as you just said, this this reporting that that some of you had sort of put Emmett up to this provocative gesture. Um, other reports that he had photos of of white girls in his wallet mm -hmm. and right. you no. were No, it, it, if he had them, he didn't show them to us, you know. But they try to make out that he was showing them. I said, no, none of that happened. But it's in history, yeah. and I'm trying to correct it. Exactly. So you get back home, and um, there's, a, there's a gentle, friendly conspiracy between you and your... Well, it was... Uh, to keep it quiet. Unusual quiet. But we, we, we just didn't want him to, you know, that, he, he felt daddy was going to send him home. So it was unusual quiet and just laid on, we went to bed, getting ready for the next day. Yeah. You mentioned in your book that there's a, uh, you, you say a neighbor girl, I don't know how old she was, who, who the next day, or maybe even later that, no, I guess it was the next the day. The next day, right. Uh, Ruth Mae Crawford. Ruth Mae Crawford, she was uh, 16 at the time. Okay. And she told us, because her brother, uh, not her brother, her uncle, Roosevelt Cross was her uncle, and apparently he told his family what happened. And she told us the next day, she said, you all gonna hear some more about this. She said, we know these people. And of course we was uh, apprehensive maybe the first day, but after, you know, Thursday passed and Friday passed and nothing happened, we forgot all about it. So. Yeah. And by Saturday? Saturday, we, we, we're getting ready to go to Greenwood. It's, man, it's, first you secure a ride, and, and man, it was something. I mean, you have that joy, you have that, it's Christmas morning in August to go to Greenwood and to enjoy the foot-long hot dog, the malt, and go to the movies, and, and it's, it was something. From 6 p.m. until 12 midnight, we would be there in Greenwood, Mississippi. Mostly on one street, Johnson Street. Johnson Street. And I think your older brother, Maurice, was sort of in charge of the car that night. Maurice had our car. Yeah. So I secured a ride with, uh, right. with uh, Roosevelt Crawford's brother, John Crawford. And Maurice, Wheeler, and Emmett was in the car together with Roosevelt. But we all wound up at the same spot, Johnson Street. And did y'all come back in those same arrangements that took We the all day? get home around the same time yeah. because okay. everything shuts down at 12 midnight. And, and we went to bed that night. It's just like any other night. But then within an hour, a couple of hours, our world was turned upside down. It was never the same again. I, the men, Callan's husband, Roy Bryant, J.W. Milan, they came to the house about 2 a.m. I don't know the exact time, but somewhere in that vicinity. And of course the house was four bedrooms. Wheeler, the first house was on the west side of the house where Wheeler was sleeping. They went in there. They awakened Wheeler and Said, this is the wrong boy. So we're looking for the fat boy from Chicago. And they marched around to my bedroom. And I heard the noise, you know, the loud talking. And I, I woke up and saw these two white men standing at the foot of my bed. One had a gun, flashlight. Later on, I found out it was 
J.W. Milo. He ordered me to lay back down and go back to sleep, and he made him get up and dress and march him out to the truck. A lot of things happened before they marched him out because I still didn't know what was going on. Then, then when my mother came in there and she was half talking and half pleading with them to leave him alone, that she would give them money to leave him alone. And Roy kind of hesitated at when they heard money, you know. But J.W. Miley, he didn't hesitate at all. And he, before he left my bedroom, he asked my daddy, how old was he? Of course, at the time, my daddy told him he was 64. And J.W. said that if you tell anybody about this, you won't live to get 65. And they marched him, and I, Emmett didn't say one word. Your mother, your mother kind of knew somehow, maybe. Well, she knew, she knew the, <clears throat> how low down those segregationists were. She knew. I didn't know because I, I wasn't old enough. We, we, but she knew. My dad knew too. And once, once they marched him out to the truck, and a lady voice responded when they asked, is this the right one? A lady responded, he is. I saw him say, who was it? I said, we believed at that time it was Carolyn Bryant. Nothing has happened in 56 years that caused me to change my mind. I still believe it was her. I would go to my grave believing that. Now she has a chance to rebut that, but she chose not to. And they drove off and we never saw him in alive again. But in that house that night, I never went back to sleep. My mother, she ran to neighbors, tried to get them to help the straw boss, and he wouldn't get involved. Chambly, I don't know how they spell his name. All I know is Mr. Chambly, his one son named Bruce. And, but she came back to the house, and, and all my dad could say was, mm, mm, mm. I just couldn't go, couldn't call the police. We didn't have a phone, and there was no police. You had to get hold to the, the sheriff, and he wasn't going to do anything until the next day. My mother was half crying, half talking. And she finally told my dad, she said, I can't stay here another night. And he had to get up, <clears throat> drive her to Sumner, where her brother lived. And he dropped her off there for safety. And she stayed there until Emmett's body was found. Then she left Sumner and came to Chicago. She never set foot in that house again. And so we was there in Mississippi with no mother, no one to sing. It was terrible. Because yeah. we didn't know at the time what had happened to him, and we was hoping that he wasn't killed, that we would get him back. And a whole lot of emotion was going on there. And we got through it, but it was tough. It was tough. On that Sunday morning, your, your father, I think, decided that a uh, phone call needed to be made to Emmett's mother in Chicago. Right after we contacted the, the sheriff and let him know what happened, the, we used the, the boss man. He's the only one that had a telephone. He let us use his phone. And the boy that claimed that he was at the store that night, Emmett, Actually, he, he arrived at my house that, that same night Emmett was kidnapped. Now, I didn't know he was in the house. I asked Wheeler, I said, How did, did he come with you all? He said, no. So we don't know who brought him there, but he, we had a spare bedroom, and he was sleeping in the spare bedroom. He didn't stay with other family. Right, he, he came to Mississippi to stay with his aunt in Greenwood, and he traveled back to our country home that, that Saturday night, and he was asleep. He never... He never woke up, and I think Wheeler, even today, glad just was glad he never woke up because he he had no sense of danger either, and he probably would have tried to resist. And probably he's the one that made the phone call. He called his mom, and which was my oldest sister, Willa May, and she got in contact with uh, Mamie, Emmett's mother. Obviously, at the time, you wouldn't have known this, but, but later, and as you grew older and looked back on this, that Mrs. Till was, was uh, not passive. She took a, 
whole range of steps very quickly. Yes, she did. Come to shape the events in significant ways. She did that. Yes, she she uh, she wouldn't lay down. She wouldn't. What happened to her son? She was not going to let it rest until she got justice, and she fought down through the years, trying to get justice for her son. And of course, she passed away in 2003 before the federal government decided to investigate the case. And but she did what she could. And some some things that uh, was said that I, I explained in my book. I said. That's a mother's love talking. It's not the facts. There's a difference in a mother's love and facts. Tell me about those um, couple of days until the, the body is discovered and, that, and learning that news. Well, Monday was a normal scheduled work day. Well, the night we spent, the next two nights with neighbors, my dad you know, took us over to Mr. Clinton Lewis. He had his own land. We had about five black families around that had their own land, so we stayed with them for a couple of nights. My brother Robin and I, I'm, I'm not sure who Maurice stayed with, and after two days, we realized that daddy's not afraid. We're not afraid either, so we went back home. And, but, but that Monday, we, we was right back out in the cotton field, picking, wondering, hoping that we would see him alive again. And Monday, the same thing, Tuesday, same thing, picking cotton all day. Wednesday, some men came and uh, talking to my dad, then they left. And we, we figured at that time something had occurred, they had found him or whatnot, and that's when they had found his body uh, in the Tallahassee River, about 20 miles north of where we live. And actually, they wanted us to bury his body that same day. The, we had the body. They shipped it, uh, this Tallahassee County sent it out to LaFleur County where he was kidnapped from and we had the grave dug, the body there and Sheriff of LaFleur County came, George Smith, and put a stop to it because the undertaker kind of protested, said that he was told to bury the body today and George Smith said, I'm, I'm the sheriff in LaFleur County there would be no barrier here today. I mean, he just jumped in his car and, you know, back in those days, instead of getting rubber, you just spin the wheels and throw gravel all over the place. That stopped that. George Smith. Do you understand, you wouldn't have known at the time, but do you understand now how it was that, um, that Sheriff Smith intervened to stop the burial, what his motives were in doing that? Well, number one, that I, from what I gathered down through the year, Lee Floor County was a little bit more fair than Tallahassee, and he was not going to have that stain on his record. He did all he could to get these men, but he came up against those segregationists, and same thing happened in Lee Floor County. When my dad went back for the kidnapping trial, same thing happened. Same caliber of people said, no true bill, whatever that means. But he. He, he was determined to, to get justice, but probably the sheriff of uh, Tallahatchie was determined but until somebody got to him. Because when somebody got to Strider, he, even he changed in during the trial. He, he testified for the defense. And that's almost, I don't know if he's supposed to do that or not. Doesn't the sheriff work for the prosecutor? <laughs> that's what I see on television. Well, I don't know. Strider testified for the defense. Yeah. Can you tell what you mean? The defense, he was a defense witness about uh, the body that was pulled out of the Tallahassee River. See, at first he was saying it was a, a black man, then he changed it and said, yeah, I can't tell whether it was white or black. And that obviously connected to the defense argument that we're not even sure this is the right. body of Emmett Till. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. It's interesting that, um, so, so George Smith, the, to return to him for just a moment, in some sense, in all this landscape of, of just ubiquitous and overwhelming white racist culture, George Smith, in some sense, is doing his job as a sheriff in at least that small moment in time. He tried. Some of them tried, yeah. Yeah. but it's it was too many. It was too many segregationists there yeah. to to overcome them. Yeah. He did what he could. Yeah. He arrested them. He had a. <clears throat> uh, 
grand jury hearing on it and whatnot, but the grand jury said, I guess they said it was not, not enough evidence. Well, late, that was later for the, yeah. for the uh, kidnapping. Kidnapping, but I put real eyewitnesses, yes. and they admitted they took him. I mean, this, this, this is a done deal. But that shows you how evasive and evil the, the segregationist was. Did he have to go in front of a grand jury in the first instance to get the murder indictment? Oh, so, yes. Yeah. But that was, that was uh, they, I, from what I hear later, it was the debate whether they're going to try to get a murder indictment in Tallahassee County or Ta uh, Lee Floor. They felt they had a better chance in Tallahassee County. Yes, so they did it right. Yeah. Yeah. You obviously didn't go to Chicago for the trial. Oh, excuse me, for the funeral. No, I didn't. We had to, we had to stay for the trial. Uh, we <clears throat> Actually, I'm the one to identify the ring that was taken off the body. They, I said, my daddy never identified that ring. He said the ring cleared it up, but when the sheriff brought the ring out and was showing it to my dad, and I said, that's Bobo's ring, that's what we call him. And of course I had to go to Sumner and I didn't know what I was doing, I was talking to the, the lawyers and that's how they trick you up, they get you, you, you know, but uh, this is it, this is Emmett's ring. And I was subpoenaed to, you know, to appear as a material witness. But the only reason that I wasn't called when Mamie came down there, when she was put on the stand, she identified the ring as that being her son. Hey, let me ask you about the trial. You were, you were um, anticipating, as you say, anticipating perhaps being called as a witness, and you spent time during the trial waiting in the witness room. Right. Mm -hmm. Can you recall and describe that it's a complicated several days and it's so full of so many things, but can you describe some of the things that come first to your mind when you think about that? Well, being in the, in the witness room, one of the bailiff was looked like he was extraordinary nice to me and made sure that I was comfort, comfortable. And the, the, the cameras and the newspaper reporters and all that swarming around out, even when I would go outside of the witness room standing there, it was, it was a circus atmosphere. But I'm thinking, hey, whoa, whoa, this is a done deal. We're going to get a conviction. You know? Because I guess I watched too many cowboy movies. The bad guy always got caught. But I've learned a lesson about uh, segregation and racism. When you think back on, say, the, all of the folks who came to that courthouse and the men, and it was 12 white men on that jury and that judge, Do you ever ask yourself, well, how, how is it that these people can, can hold this sort of, this, this viewpoint, this, this whole way of thinking about race in the world and all? Do you, is there any way that, is there any way that you can think about that that makes any sense to you? After <clears throat> reflecting on it, I, I, it doesn't make sense what I said, it, 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 it goes deeper than the color of my skin. And I, as I reflect, I said, I think it goes all the way back to the Civil War, where these men lost a way of life and they blame me because I'm black. I mean, they were the aristocrats of America and they lost that. And from that, that hatred began to fester and has been passed on down through the generations. Because the kids, they're not born with that. Someone has to teach them that. The, the young men that we played with, they, they weren't racist. I mean, why? We ate together. We fought together. We hunt snakes together. That was their idea, not ours. It's, I thought they was half crazy. But sooner or later, someone older had to tell them that we were different and that you couldn't play with. You know, after we get a certain age, we had to separate. Even my mother told me when I, the, the boss, one boss man had a son named Tommy, Tommy Peterson. He used to come and get me to go swimming with him. And, and my mother said one day, said, when you get older, you're gonna have to call him Mr. And I said, not so, I'm not gonna do it. So that was a change right then in, the, in, in our attitude and thinking, I'm not gonna call Tommy Mr. Unless, of course, it, now I call a young man Mr. He might be young enough to be my grandson. It depends on what kind of job he has. I, I don't go to a high school and call this young boy 
John, I call him Mr. Whoever he is because of his position. But just to call him Mr. because he's white, oh no. That was, that was changing. Tell me Joe, about Joe, yeah. let's take a little pause. Okay. Just for, okay, okay, we're running again. Ms. Wright, I'd like to, I'd like to spend a, a few minutes talking about um, the, the, the move your family then makes and the feelings of your father that it's time to go, we'll, we'll leave. Can you describe how that all came to pass and how you, how you made the move to Chicago? Well, I, I remember after the trial was over and we left that, that little town, Sumner, looking back and realizing we had no one to help us. The verdict, not guilty, people rejoicing. Of course, the other expression, the segregation is rejoicing at the verdict. And we was crushed, daddy was crushed at that verdict. Yet he, from what I uh, learned later, he had an idea of what was going to take place, but he still crushed him. And he came home, somewhere, he had been somewhere that Saturday morning after the verdict, and came back home, he said, boys, we can't stay in any longer, we have to leave. Your, your father, in taking, the, in, in taking the decision to testify, had obviously done something that um, put him and all of you in that sense in a, in a very precarious and dangerous position. Dangerous, yes. And obviously he understood that and he decided to testify anyway. He understood that because the neighbors, the neighbors was trying to, to convince him not to testify. It, telling him, said they're gonna kill you. And of course, Medgar Edwards, he was down for the NAACP, encouraging my daddy that they were gonna do all they could to protect him and whatnot. And so finally one, one day my dad said, I, I know one thing. I know I'm gonna testify. Whether I live, I don't know. So he knew by testifying he could be killed for this. But he said, a man has to do what a man has to do. And he did it. He did something that no other black man had ever done in Mississippi and lived to tell about it. In years later, months later, years later, did your father ever talk with you about that night? Did he revisit that? Was that something that he no, he, he, never, he no, never talked about what happened at that store. We never brought that up. Uh, even Emmett's mother, we never talked about it. She never really asked us what happened to you. And for years, I, I wouldn't talk about it. I worked with Mill Wright's pipe fitters at Reynolds Meadows, and after 20 years, they saw me on television. They said we had no idea because I never talked about it. And, but daddy, he put his life on the line. He, he, he was so devastated. You know, I, it's like sending your son in the care of someone else and your son come up killed or murdered. It, 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 it destroys you, it, not, it, it just tears your heart apart. And he was willing to die to bring justice to Emmett Till. Can you talk a little bit about your, um, both your mother and your father, when they, how they made the transition into a new life in Chicago, because that clearly was so much at odds with the life that they had known, and mm -hmm. such a big shift, <clears throat> such traumatic and horrible circumstances. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, the, the life in Mississippi, working was so much different than the North. In Mississippi, you had, my dad had, the winter off, you could hunt, you could fish. Mississippi, even now, if it's raining, I love rainy days because in Mississippi, if it rains, you got a day off and the next day you can go fishing. So the work was different. And, and you got, at that time, my dad was uh, 64. We found out later that it actually was uh, 63 at the time. But we, we went back and got the census records and whatnot. And at that time, when we moved to Argo Summit, there was no job for a 63-year-old in the factories. They just wasn't going to hire you. He was too old. So he really couldn't get the job or make the money that he was making in Mississippi. He made good money in Mississippi because we had a, we had a boss man that was a German. 
believe it or not, and he was fair. He was a born again Christian. He was fair to us. And Dad always cleared money. At the end of the year, 2000, I think in 1948, they cleared about $6,000. I mean, that's after all your bills are paid. I mean, you find somebody doing that now. Today, that's, that's a lot of money. And when he got here, all he could find was uh, restaurant work, cleaning up, whatnot. And the thing that really helped us was my older brother, James. He had a four flat. And he let my dad and <clears throat> our family live there, rent free, until my dad moved out in 1964, I believe. That's why I tell kids, I said, I never left home. I said, you got to be out of your mind. My mama cooking every day, washing my clothes. I said, they moved off and left me. The place they, they got wasn't big enough for me. I've been on my own ever since then. What about your mother's experience? That experience changed her soul. I, I think it took years off of her life. She never could get over that. She was a church woman. She was used to singing. Every, you, could kept, you could hear her singing every day in Mississippi. I don't remember her singing here because of that. And, and she, she worried about it and she, she just thought about it. I think what really helped her one day, she was thinking about it and she said, the Spirit of the Lord said, these men have killed whole families and nothing was done. He said, I spared your family to, from being killed. That, I think that kind of comforted her a little bit, but she never could shake it. My mother couldn't shake it, and Maurice couldn't shake it, because Maurice thought my dad should have resisted. But resist with what? This man got a gun. What you gonna resist? How are you gonna resist? Resistance probably would've been death to us all. And, but she, she held on to her faith in the Lord and, and until she passed away, you know. Young, I call 70 young, that's young. I mean, she was 70 <laughs> when she passed away. But she was, oh, I tell you. What, the, what did the writer say? He said he took one look at my mother and realized she was uneducated. That's why I don't believe a word he say. How can you look at a person and tell they're uneducated? That's what he said. That's why I put a picture of my mom in the, in the book there. Because in African-American uh, culture back then, they were well educated. She did all the reading, told us about all of the stories and the Lindbergh cases and the kidnappings and Hogjaw Mullins and how did he, if a prisoner escaped in Mississippi, they'd send Hall Joe after him. He always got his man. We heard that from my mother. Wanting us never to go on ice in Mississippi. My brother Robert was ice fishing one day and the ice broke. He almost died. I just said a few words. The only thing I said to him, I said, you know better. Mama told you not to do that, but he, he won't do it anymore. But she was somebody. You were only 12, which is pretty young. 12, yes. Only 12 at the time. That's really pretty young. And you came up and had to make the whole transition and um, went to school? Just Argo right School, down started right down the street, Argo School, yeah. sixth grade. Not two blocks from where we are now. Right. Um, and made your way forward. Um, and I want to ask, um, because I think this goes in important ways, as you explain in the book, to, to the question of how we try to make sense of these kinds of things. Um, Martin Luther King obviously came to Chicago. Exactly. And brought a certain message of a certain strategy to Chicago, mm -hmm. as he mm -hmm. earlier argued in other places too. And, and that wasn't necessarily a message that really persuaded you at that time. Can you talk a little bit about that? No, the message was he, he wanted us to march with him in Chicago, Market Park, nonviolence. And my friends and I, we were told that if we got slapped or spit on, we couldn't retaliate. We said, no way. So 
So if they sit up, we're going to sit up back. You're not going to stop my car and pull me out of it. It's not going to happen. Now, a lot of people might get ran, they put got ran over, but I wasn't going to stop my car and let you pull me out because I know from Mississippi what them segregation will do to you. And we, I, I, was, I wasn't a violent person, but if you, you slapped me, I was going to try and slap you back if I thought I could win. Now, if I thought I couldn't win, I might wait my chance. But I came to, after years, I would say at age 24, I was getting into a lot of scuffles uptown there. It, nothing serious. I mean, we didn't carry guns or knives, fist fights or whatnot. And we knew the, the boys, they started drinking beer and, and they couldn't help it. They had to call us the N-word. We knew that. And when they did, we, the fight was started. And me and my friend Jesse, who passed on, and one night about age 24, I'm sitting in this tavern half high and some people say you don't hear voices, but I, I heard this this night. It wasn't an audible voice, but I heard it very clear. I was, I had a buzz, and this voice, it didn't say, I love you, or didn't say, I know what you've been through with. All I heard was, it said, if you're dying your sins, you're going to hell. That changed my life. I left that tavern within two weeks. I had quit drinking, quit smoking, quit my girlfriend. Went to a church, committed my life to Christ. Now I see the nonviolent way is the way to go. If you're gonna change things in America, in any country, it has to be nonviolent. Because if you resort to violence, then the authority is gonna to resort to violence and a lot of people are gonna be killed. I mean, in America. I mean, we see it overseas where, where people are being killed by the government. I haven't forgotten Kent State. It'll happen in America, trust me, even today. So the nonviolent way is the way to go. But my early years in Summit, I did a lot of things to keep money in my pocket. My dad didn't have a lot of money. I let, stated, I think, after I got my first job, I never asked my dad for another dollar or whatnot because I know he didn't have it. I started shining shoes on the street. I did pretty good. Then I started working in the bowling alley. <clears throat> Hard work, harder than picking cotton, but it was just two, three hours long. Resetting pins. Said spot, pins yeah, said pins, man, that's yeah. jumping two alleys. And you got to figure, I'm 105 pounds. And four, you got to pick up two pins in one hand. And, but I did that. But I had a friend of mine, this is what she said. I'd never known him to be broke. I kept money in my pocket. Shining, I shined shoes, actually, after I left the street, I started shining in a shoe shine parlor for another band. Then I shined on my own, I had my own parlor in Wheeler's Barber Shop until I got out of high school. And I finished that and of course I got a different job, started it <clears throat> about two blocks from here, a place called Dearborn Glass, stayed there about three years. And then I got a job at Reynolds Meadows and working as a laborer. I said, this is crazy. I said, I'm going back to school. I said, this don't make sense. And I was planning on going to college and I read in the union paper they had an apprenticeship program starting up in the pipe shop, electrical, I believe machine shop. And I took the test for machine shop because I had machine shop in high school. But no opening came up and the guy, I, the guy told me, the personnel manager said, well, we got an opening in pipe shop or electrical. I thought about electricity. I said, my goodness, <laughs> I'm scared of that stuff. And so I selected the pipe shop. And I, the apprenticeship program was ministered by 597 out of Chicago, and I spent from 1968 until 1994, pipe fitting, in-house fitter, 
from 94 to 2004 outside construction. Of course, I retired from Reynolds after 28 years at age 51. Or I say 51 and <laughs> actually it was August 26, 1994. Is that right? Yeah, August 26. I said I should have just couple more days to August 28th, the night that Emmett was kidnapped. In these years, you have, you have lots of extended family here, obviously, people whose lives are all connected to, to the Emmett Till case, just as yours is. And uh, mm -hmm. was it something that, that had, a, that had a, an obvious presence in your lives? On, and if so, on what kind of frequency? I mean, I mean something that you all publicly acknowledged. Obviously, it was all very much a part of your lives, but was it, was it acknowledged amongst you in any circumstances or instances? Well, most, <clears throat> most of the family members was quiet about it. They, they really didn't want to talk about it, especially on my, uh, my mother's side. They, they just they were so devastated about it that they never really brought it up at family meetings and reunions or whatnot. On my father's side, they, they would bring it up sometime because <clears throat> it was my uncle that drove us to the train station, you know, to get out of Mississippi. But it, most of it was it just, we just didn't talk about it that much. It was it's something about a tragedy like that. You, even my friends, when I was out drinking and acting a fool, I never brought it up, but they would. They would bring it up. It's, it's not something that I'm going to bring up Myself, but if you bring it up, I'll talk about it. Did you have a close relationship? <laughs> I mean, a, can you describe your relationship? Obviously, it was close, but can you describe your relationship with, with Reverend Parker now as, as you were both here in Chicago and, and coming up in age? Oh, you know, he's a little bit taller than I am. Uh, I tried to whip him one time. I didn't do too good. But doing down through the years, you know, he was in high school. We didn't have too much contact. But after he committed his life to Christ, and he would come to this little place. It would be a tavern and restaurant combined. And we would, I would look at him and say, man, he got something I, something I want. I could see the difference. I could see the, every time I would see him, I, I could see the difference, the joy and the peace that he had. And this is one of the things that I, I remember most about him standing up for Jesus Christ and uh, as an example, and I, I would look at that and say, that's what I want, that's what I want. I think that, that was the main, one of the main issues of causing me to commit my life. I could see the joy that was in him. And man, have you ever waken every morning with a smile on your face? That's something. And that's the extent, actually, uh, then of course he got married. I was selected to be the best man. And of course he's still married to the. I mean that's the way we were trained. We we weren't trained to put them away. We were trained to keep them. <laughs> but then of course now he's my pastor. He's my pastor, and I'm at this church. I'm deacon, but I I, I like. To tell people, I teach the second and third graders. Oh, we have a wonderful time. That's more important than being a deacon. Yeah. So. Tell me about how, um, if you would please, how um, the Till case found its way back in a more <clears throat> uh, involving way into your life. Well, actually, that started. For years, I wouldn't talk about it. But that started after I began to look at the documentaries. Uh, some of the reporters that I talked to would take what I told them, what happened at the store, and they would merge it with what's in history and just mess the story all out. It's, it's so much stuff out there now, especially on the internet. I, I tell the kids, I said, there's a lot of information on the internet, but it's not all true. And after I see these stories and inaccuracies, I, I can name them, oh my goodness, that my daddy escaped Mississippi in a coffin, that we dad Emmett to go and 
uh, say something to Kellen Bryant, that Emmett didn't whistle? Because so, some people want to know, say, why do, you, why do you get upset? I get upset because you're calling me a liar. He whistled. I mean, that's always been that. And what James Hicks said about my father, that he stood up in court and said, da, he, I stand and talk like that. And I'm glad I, I put a portion of that in my, that my dad's testimony in the book to, to tell the world what he, what he said, because I think they got a play called da, he, that's shown in the South. And all of these things, you know, it, it, it bring back sad memories, and I'm, I'm trying my best to correct history and let the people know. It was a sad story, but we got through it, and changes have, can be made. It depends on the generation that's in charge. The generation under the Jim Crow system, they made the laws, and they didn't abide by them. That's sad. Let me ask you about um, 2004 and 2005. Mm -hmm. Can you describe the, what, the, the series of things that happened that, that caused the case ultimately to be, in a formal sense anyway, re reopened? And mm -hmm. there were some fairly significant events associated with that. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things was a uh, young filmmaker, Keith Beauchamp. He tried to get me to talk to him for I don't know how long. I refused to talk to him until my wife finally said, well, why don't you talk to him? I said, he's a young black filmmaker. He said, it was a white boy. He had lived across your threshold, and, and he wouldn't leave until he got the story. So I began to tell him about what happened at the store and what happened in my bedroom. He began to investigate, and he came across the gun that was used. And he came across certain uh, things that took place on the federal level, and he got uh, a boy by the name of Alvin Sykes involved in it, and they began to piece together some federal violation that had taken place and, and federal, uh, I guess, uh, charges that can justify them in actually getting into the case. And this is what happened. We actually we traveled to Mississippi to talk to Mr. Greenleaf. He was the Northern District State's Attorney, a U.S. Attorney at the time. And I went into his office and I told him the story of what happened. And he was visibly shaken. And he promised me at the time that he would do all he could to get the case reinvestigated. And we, I left Mississippi believing that he was going to do that, and he did. He told me about the prosecutor, Mr. Chapman, I believe, that he never could shake that. He was so disappointed in the verdict that, it, that he died actually before his time. So a lot of people, white and black, was very upset over what happened to Emmett and what happened to the justice system in Mississippi, but they couldn't do anything about it. It's a really interesting part of that, that reopening of the case, that um, it, it, it gets launched as a, as a joint effort between the Justice Department, federal level, mm -hmm. and the state of Mississippi. <clears throat> right. And all these years later, as we know, some things have changed. Mm -hmm. And interestingly enough, in Fort County, Mississippi, the prosecutor is now a <coughs> black woman. Mm -hmm. And I'd like you to talk about the bodies exhumed here in Chicago. Mm -hmm. DNA testing is done. But then ultimately, you get a report with no explanation from Mississippi that the case will not be reopened. And, I, and I'm particularly in relation to Carolyn Bryant. Can you, can you describe that series of events in some detail? Because I know in your book you, you say that, I, that, that you finished that experience not understanding why, even now, that that case was not pursued. Well, the, the exhibition, the, you know, the state of Mississippi and the federal government combined, the state of Mississippi told us that unless we could prove to them that the body buried at Burr Oak was Emmett Till, they would not reopen the case if they had enough information. So that's why we had to do the exhumation. 
and we were put in motion to exhume his body. Of course, there was a opposition from so-called one cousin. We found out later that some of the civil rights, so-called civil rights workers put her up to that. And because the newspaper was announcing that there's a controversy in the family about the exhumation, some family members, I said, get out. So we agreed on that already. And I said, the girl that's protesting, she wasn't born then. And the people that was putting her up to it, they just wanted to get some TV time. Because during that time, it, there was nine of us that had to say so. Six of them was in my family. So we had six to three right there. So that was never a controversy. So that's why we had to exhume the body. We exhumed uh, Emmett's body. Uh, we found out some things that, that's been reported was, that wasn't true. The DNA testing was done. Uh, Wheeler just found out a couple of weeks ago that I was a donor, that uh, he, he didn't know. I never, I never told anyone. I said, I don't like to go around, you know. And we found out that <clears throat> he wasn't castrated. Like some has said, I, I heard it from a young man. I didn't comment on him because I didn't know. I didn't go around telling people he was castrated. I didn't know. But I found out he wasn't castrated. I found out that his teeth wasn't knocked out. And, but it had to be done to prove to Mississippi. And the DNA testing proved to the state of Mississippi that there was indeed Emmett and Bur Barry Burrow. And after we had gone through all of this, gathered all of the information, Trace the gun back, the, the shell in what was used back to Bryant and Milam, and the state of Mississippi came, still came out. And Joyce Childs said there just wasn't enough information to bring an indictment against Callum Bryant. We just didn't have enough information. Yet we had a witness to put her in that truck 8 o'clock that night. So maybe someone else might look at the evidence and say, well, we got enough. Do you know, did, did Joyce Childs, who's the, who's the local prosecutor at that time, mm -hmm. down Mississippi, do you know if she was able to question Mrs. Bryant or was she able to in any way? I don't think she yeah. questioned it, just the FBI yeah. that was in charge. Yeah. Question on. He told me that she wanted immunity. She said she would talk, but she wanted immunity from prosecution. Oh, you heard that from the Oh, yeah. Client. Yeah, but uh, they wouldn't give it to her. Right. Yeah. Right. Interesting. Oh. Um, how'd you feel at the end of that couple of years having. I mean, that's a lot to go through. Well, I was greatly disappointed that, you know, you just indict her, make her talk, give her something to think about. But they didn't do it. I, I, from what I understand, George Child didn't present the case before the grand jury. It was one of her associates. And I don't know whether she was forceful or persuasive in her arguments or, or what. There'd be another, um, another part of the long legacy of this case that will take you to Washington uh, subsequent then in, in 2000, well, in several, in several occasions, mm -hmm. uh, and that's the, what some persons call the, the Till Bill. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about the genesis of, of that legislation and kind of your perspective on, on its course and its form? And, well, it, it started with uh, Avin Sykes out of uh, Kansas City, Missouri. He, he pursued the case and he, uh, apparently he had connection with the senator from Kansas City and they pursued to get the Teal Bill passed, a bill that's designed to set aside funding to go after cold cases that has not been settled. Uh, and they began to pursue that, and they, they began to talk about it. Uh, <clears throat> I, I probably felt the same way when they said, we're going to try and reopen this case. I said, oh, it never happened. 
And as they began to uh, pursue and phone calls were made and, and one day I got a call that said they're gonna have a vote on the Teal Bill. Can you, can you come to Washington? So my wife and I, we jumped in our cars and we drove to Washington. We were sitting in the gallery when they were debate, debating the bill, but that day it wasn't passed. We had one holdout senator and later on, a few months later, they came together and they passed the Teal Bill, setting aside, I think it was a million dollars to go out to cold cases and in honor of Emmett Teal. I think this is, this is great legislation because a young man was killed for no reason at all and this is one way to remember him, to show the world. The only thing else that I probably would, is looking for, I, I doubt if it would happen, the state of Mississippi or the county or Lee floor come out and say the verdict was unjust. I don't think they uh, have enough nerve to say that. Even if they don't have enough nerve, just give me the permission to say it for them. I speak for them. I tell them the verdict was unjust. If the verdict was just, if there was a guilty verdict, we wouldn't be sitting here today talking about Emmett Till. We would have forgotten about it by now. But because of that verdict, M is still memory and legacy is still alive. John, can we pause just for a moment? Yeah, we're, we're set. We've had a, a brief pause, and um, Mr. Wright, I wanted to ask about you've done so much in your book as a central thrust of your book to set the record down as if mm -hmm. events actually happened and make sure that, that the circumstances of the Till case are understood for what they were. Um, I want to talk a little bit about maybe some of the reasons why in the more, not just popular tellings, but then what became even the scholarly tellings, frankly, the more formal academic tellings of the circumstances of the Till case. Um, things were so askew and in some key details. And in that connection, I wanna ask you about your perspective on both James Hicks and William Bradford Huey. Hicks being, in fact, an African-American journalist who covered the case in Sumner in 55 mm -hmm. for um, the black press. And then Huey, who wrote a piece in the January 56 mm -hmm. issue of Look Magazine. Mm -hmm. uh, James Hicks. He's the black reporter. I think at the time he worked for the African American Press, and he put out. I'm not sure exactly when he came out with this. Given my daddy's testimony, that my daddy stood up, pointed at J. J. W. Milam, and said "Dahi," and this is his history that my dad said "Dahi," but my daddy didn't talk like that. I have a copy of the trial transcript. My dad stood up and said, there he is. And there's Mr. Bryant sitting next to him. And things like that. And then James Hicks said he helped my daddy escape Mississippi in a coffin. He, he began to describe or to uh, a reporter or someone from Washington University in St. Louis there, how that he and uh, Meg, Meg Evers was helping my dad escape and telling how fast he would drive in one way and make him ever drive in 75 miles an hour the next way. I don't know why he knew all of this. And that they had put my dad in a coffin and they drove him to Memphis, Tennessee to catch a, the train there. So I, I asked the question, I said, Mose Wright had three sons there. How did they get out? Did they have four coffins? So it's inaccuracies like this that I'm trying to correct. James Hicks asked me, said, why did he say that? I said, he wanted the world to think that he was an expert on the Emmett Till case. And he came up with that preposterous idea. Uh, William Bradford here, I, I have no confidence in his writing when he wrote a piece and said that he took one look at my mother and realized she was uneducated. Then he said that he interviewed us here in Argo and that we, we showed him where Callum Bryant lived, not Callum, where his white girlfriend lived, and, and we were discussing 
Why did he ever go to bed with her? And I said, hey, get out of here. We never talked to him. He never interviewed us, but he got away with it. I don't know how much money he made off of it, but these things he put out there. So I don't believe practically anything he said. Even the interview with Roy Bryant and J.W. Meyer. I don't believe what he's, all he said about what took place. I don't need him to say that to convince me that J.W. Meyer and Roy Bryant killed Emmett Till. I don't need that. I knew that before he wrote that piece. But why he did it, some say he was a checkbook journalist, I don't know, whatever that means, but he did it. He put a lot of inaccuracies out there. I'm trying to correct it, set the record straight. I just got a call from a lady who wanted me to endorse a play in Virginia, Hampton, Virginia. She told me what was in the play. I said, I don't endorse stuff like that. It's not true. I will not speak to the press to give you any publicity on that because they had in this, this play that Emmett was trying to say bubble gum and, and that we put him up to doing what he did. And she thanked me, said, you're awful brave. I don't have to be brave to say that. I just tell you the way it is. If it's not true, I'm not going to endorse it. Tell the truth or shut up. There's been another, another of these inaccuracies. I don't think we've touched on them. It's an important one, and I wanted to ask you about it. There was even an account um, that circulated that, um, that your brother Maurice had, uh, had taken 50 cents, had, had, had been persuaded by 50 cents a store credit from the Bryant store to, uh, to, to assist in locating your house. Right, so uh, I, I, I read that in a magazine, Emerged Magazine, 1995. I think that's the first time I've seen that in print and I was shocked that that was out there, that Maurice for 50 cents store credit showed Roy Bryant and J.W. Myers where we live. Now, all the reports I've heard, Roy Bryant and J.W. Myron wasn't home from that Wednesday night until that Friday night. But this is not true. We had no credit at, at Roy Bryant's store. We hardly ever went in there. If, we was, if the other stores had been open, we were going somewhere else. But that was the only store open that night. And plus, they didn't give us credit. Trust me. No credit. Cash only. As you think back on uh, how you make your way with all this, can you talk a little bit about how um, your view of, this, of the uh, indispensability of nonviolence kind of became your perspective on this question and how you think about that issue now? What, ha what happened at age 24 when Dr. King came to town in 1966? He wanted us to march. I said, no way. Because they said, if it's set up, you can't snap back. I wasn't a proponent of nonviolent at the time. I thought that, man, set up, you, you have a right to protect yourself, to fight back. But then at age 24, I was after, I don't know if we had had a fight that night or not. It wasn't nothing serious. And no one was seriously hurt. Uh, I was sitting in the tavern about 2 a.m. and. I heard, I heard this voice. It wasn't an audible voice, but I heard this voice. I heard this. Uh, it didn't say, you know, a lot of people say, oh, he said, he, he didn't say he loved me. Or he, he didn't say, I know what you've been through, but this is what I heard. He said, if you die in your sins, you're going to hell. And that changed my life forever. Within two weeks, I haven't had a drink since. That was 1967, February 1967. I took my cigarettes, I threw them in the garbage. I called my girlfriend over to my house. I laid her off, quit her, because church back then, couldn't kiss a girl, what are you gonna do with her? And I just committed my life to Christ and I would catch the bus and go to Chicago to stay in a hot church service because when I was out in the world, I was having so much fun that I knew that if I had gone back, I would never make it back. And ever since then, I never had really a fight. I've been in a couple of tussles. A couple of young boys try to 
six, you know how 16 year olds are, they kind of rise up and reflex, reflex, and I didn't hear them, I just grabbed them and put a chokehold on them, they couldn't get away and embarrassed them. That's about all. And I've been walking with Jesus Christ since 1967, and that's what changed my perspective to love your enemy, love one another, treat others as you want to be treated. And that's, that's where I live now. I treat others the way I want to be treated. You've written that um, it became necessary for you to do something that's very difficult, but you felt ultimately just necessary for you, and that was to forgive Bryant and Milam. And I'm, I'm wondering what, what you mean exactly when you say that, and how, and what precisely you think about in your faith, in your sense of ethics. What does that mean to forgive them in a context like this? Well, they did a great crime against my family, against Emmett, and when things like that happen to you, you want vengeance. You want to get even. And usually you can't get even with the people that have committed this, this crime against you, but you take it out on someone else. And, and you're going to do that until you are able to forgive those people for doing it. And forgiveness in the sense that I'm not saying that justice shouldn't come your way. Forgiveness in the sense that I'm not going to pursue it for vengeance. That I'm going to leave vengeance to Almighty God and justice to the government. And I'm going to use the rest of my life because I don't want to get up. I know a lot of people don't believe in heaven and hell, the final judgment. I don't want him to get up there in judgment and I have something against him. I don't want that to happen. Because God said, if you don't forgive them, I won't forgive you. I've heard it explained different ways and whatnot. But it, it's a difficult process. It's, it's not something that's going to happen overnight. It's something that as you submit your will to forgiveness, God will help you through it. And pretty soon you forget about you know, the, the hurt, the anger, and whatnot, and the vengeance. You don't look, you don't seek vengeance now, you just seek justice. That's what I mean by forgiveness. What, this is kind of a difficult question in some ways to answer maybe, but <clears throat> what set of emotions do you feel when you think back about all of this? What's the mixture of feelings that you have? It depends on what brings those uh, feelings back. It could be, I was just in Houston about a month ago, I, I smelled the honeysuckle. And I, I said to my nephew, oh, that's the honeysuckle. He said, what is that? I said, I said what? everybody knows what a honeysuckle is, but that smell of that flower brings back the time I lived in Mississippi. A certain noise, car, a car going down the street, because I laid there that night, and every car that I would hear, I thought it was the J.W. Myler and the Robert bringing them back. And it, it brings back emotions. When things bad happen to you, your heart is broken. It, it's just, it's shattered. And, and God has to, to heal that. But in each broken heart, I, I, I love to tell the kids, this, especially the one that call herself Courtney, and I said, when you have a broken heart, the heart heals, but it leaves scar tissue. And a certain bump will bring back that night. It'll bring back the, the, the hurt. It'll bring back the, the grief that we had. But it, it'll pass. But it still comes back. But I, I feel that if I hadn't forgiven these people, once it came back, I would try to act it out on probably someone else. And that's the value of forgiveness. And I, I tell the kids, I, I said, there's a story in the Old Testament, the 18th chapter of Jeremiah, where, where the Lord sent Jeremiah to the potter's house. He said, I'm going to cause you to hear my word there. He saw the potter making a vessel, and the vessel was marred in his hand. And I said, that was my life. I was marred, I was broken, but I went to the potter's house, and the potter made me over again. Now I'm able to smile. How do you measure the, um, the wider legacy of 
of the Emmett Till case in our nation's history and our sense of transition or some measure of transition in our race relations and our habits and mores and opinions. And well, I've seen a lot of changes. The Emmett Till case brought about a lot of changes in the laws and federal law mostly. Thank God federal law trumps state law. We see a lot of changes there. But men's hard, I don't, I don't see too much change there. Laws can't change a man's heart. Relationship is, is better. I see things happening now that I never dreamed that would happen that I don't know whether it's good or bad. What's just happening? It's getting better. But then I see racism, it's just alive. Like I've said many times, once you've seen a water moccasin, you know it when you see it. You know the difference. In Chicago, great city, but I see it here. But it's not under Jim Crow system, it was in your face, it was forced upon you. Even if you had the money, you couldn't move to a better neighborhood. Now, in order to have the better life in America, you have to have the money. But it's getting better. As each generation comes on the scene, they see the, the injustices that have taken place. And they hear about Emmett, hopefully, because a lot of the states are trying to bury that. They don't want that, the school system don't want that known to their children. They're trying to bury it. But once they find out what happened in 1955 to Emmett Till, they are horrified and they, they promise and they make it their life legacy to bring about a change, bring about a change. Like the, I don't know the gentleman name <clears throat> that prosecuted the Ku Klux Klansman that bombed the churches in Birmingham. But he said he was sitting in college when he saw that. He's from Birmingham. And he said it made him sick to his stomach. A young law student, yet he finished his course, came out of school and prosecuted those people that did that. This is all we're looking for. And it's, it's happening, it's taking place slowly, but hopefully the economic plights now doesn't slow it down. That has a lot to do with it also. You mentioned the honeysuckle in, in Houston. Do you, do you ever, have you ever felt an impulse to go back to Mississippi? Does that call you at all? The, would you repeat the question? Sure. You mentioned honeysuckle. Mm -hmm, the in, honeysuckle. In Houston and how right. just, it just broke this memory of Mississippi. Mm -hmm. In all these years, have you ever felt any impulse to go back to Mississippi as it, or, or, to live? To live, to visit? To oh, we, I, I go back to visit. I, I know you do, but I, I guess in a way what I'm asking yeah. you to directly put is, yeah. is when you think of that place, what's the mix of, what's the mix of feelings? Well, it, it's, in one sense, it's a place of horror, but in another sense, it was a place of where I was born and raised and all of my childhood, the good memories, they are, they're still there and the bad memories. And if I go down Darkfield Road now, my wife says a whole new spirit comes over me. And of course, one day I told her, I said, I'm from this dirt. And it, but to live, I don't think so. I wouldn't wanna, it's something like Florida. Good place to visit, I wouldn't wanna live there. I mean, not in the sense, not, not trying to put Floyd in the sense of, but it's, it's a sense of beautiful there, but then the, here come the bugs. Mr. Wright, you've been so generous with all your time and accommodating us. I just want to check in with you one last time. Are there things that we haven't talked about that you'd like to, you'd like to finish up here with today? Oh, I, <clears throat> if I just, I, I've talked about it finish up with the young people. Mm -hmm. Go to school, listen to your teacher. 
Respect your elders. Love one another. Fight for one another. You can change this system. What I see coming is, is horrible, but hopefully somebody will wake up and say, hey, we're in this together. We saw some things that took place in Chicago this year to, sh to show the Chicago on how low down their police are. But especially the bartender that was beaten by this one policeman. I'm sitting here horrified how they, they're trying to get this guy off. I said, I can't believe this. It doesn't matter to me whether you're black, whether you're white. If you commit the crime, you should do the time. I've seen cases down through the years, black men commit crime and they got away with it. I said, it's not right. It's not right. If you do the crime, do the time. It's been an honor and a privilege to be with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture.